fewer than a billion people in the world are surviving on less than a dollar a day. To explain what the United Nations is doing to improve things and to talk about the case for industry rather than aid, I'm going to be joined by Kande Yum Keller, one of the UN's foremost figures, a rising star on the world stage. Well, according to the United Nations, a billion people survive on less than a dollar a day. While we in the West are experiencing the worst recession for a generation, we still need to spare a thought for the one person out of every six who has to survive on such a tiny amount. But what can we actually do to help? Is there even a desire in these straitened times to give a helping hand to nations in poverty? I'm joined now by a man who many people tip to be a future leader of the United Nations, Dr. Kande Yum Keller, who's the Director General of the UN Industrial Development Organization. Dr. Yum Keller, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Um, you're, you're launching a report um, tomorrow, a UN development report. But let me start with that first issue. These are very, very hard times around the world economically. Is there a serious danger that the, the wealthy nations, because we are still wealthy nations by comparison with many, simply turn off the aid tab? There is a danger, but we hope they don't do it. Uh, because they should, richer nations should remember that for about 15, 20 years, we have seen uh, growth in a number of developing countries. We have seen millions of people moved out of poverty because of the opportunities that globalization uh, uh, provided. You're pro so let's, let's hope it's not. Let's, I'm very pro globalization. I believe I'm a child of globalization. I'm here mm. from the poorest country in the world, Sierra Leone. But because of good education, good opportunity, I am where I am. So that's why I am a strong uh, uh, advocate for it. And I hope that uh, the recession and the depression we have in some countries does not reverse that process. Mm. Because the reality is hundreds of millions of people were moved out of poverty in the last 20 years. So we are worried about the symptoms of protectionism, as it were, that we, we begin to sense now. And you, you're, you're worried, for instance, presumably by some of the things that have been said in Washington and, 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 and Europe as well, as, as countries eye each other up again. Yes. Yeah. Let's not go back to the 1930s. I think that um, um, the, the richer countries should remember that, yes, some degree of liberal economics and the integration of poorer countries into the global economy has really been positive. Let's not reverse that process. Because lots of people would argue that globalization has actually impoverished large parts of the world, including Africa. Not true. Our report is showing how much the, the structural changes and the movement of a number of these middle-income and low-income countries into manufacturing actually lifted uh, 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 hundreds of thousands out of poverty. Are you a sort of believer in, in aid and industry rather, sorry, trade and industry rather than aid? Because there's been quite a controversy about whether aid simply keeps uh, corrupt regimes afloat, uh, Zimbabwe might be an example of that uh, over the years, and keeps people in poverty as compared to industrial development. The latter is too simplistic. You need both. You need both. You need the aid to provide the infrastructure, the enabling conditions yeah. that will allow private enterprise to, to emerge and to grow. So in my view, you need both. i give you an example. Just about three weeks ago, I was a guest speaker at the African Union Summit mm. of the heads of state. The theme was on infrastructure. Mm. Our estimate is that you need almost $80 billion between 2010 and 2015 to provide infrastructure in Africa, including energy sources, $40 billion for new investments, for new infrastructure investment, but $40 billion for maintenance. You need that if you're going to make those economies competitive and have growth. And you are a great enthusiast for industrialization, but it's got to be smart industrialization. Smart industrialization. What, what do you mean by that? Give us some examples. We, we say smart industrialization because in our, in our report, we've looked at 10 industrial clusters, China, India, Chile, and other locations, where, in fact, a country uh, does not have to specialize in producing a whole product. That was the old form of industrialization. You can actually do what we call trading tasks, specialize in certain aspects of the value chain. And we've given good examples there where uh, low-income countries and fast-growing middle-income countries have been able to do that within industrial clusters. Mm. So we The button factory, I think, in China. Was the button factory in China is one. Button town. It's button, Buttonville, yeah, uh, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Quito. And uh, that's since 85. Now it produces 65% of the world's buttons. Mm. This is not a complicated uh, uh, product, but it is, it is part of producing a good garment that probably ends on the high street in London. But that has changed that economy. So you're here to, to spread the message and enthuse people. Some people, as I was mentioning earlier on, say that you're a future head of the UN. Do you, do you think about this at all? You must think about it. I think about what I'm doing now. I, I mm. enjoy what I'm doing now, which is to advocate that for uh, low-income countries, particularly Africa, 
we, the way we look at poverty has to be different. We have to reduce poverty by creating wealth, unleashing entrepreneurship. Uh, that is part of my advocacy and helping these economies plug into globalization I think is part of the key. And thinking of some of the particularly difficult trouble spots at the moment, is there anything for instance that the UN can do when it comes to Gaza and, 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 and the Middle East? Well, we are engaged there in all uh, of these uh, hot spots. Mm. Uh, our colleagues are engaged in, in the in the They became political. targets, indeed. They yeah. became targets. Uh, some people think our job is glamorous, but it's very dangerous mm. when you're working in very tough zones, whether it's Congo, Darfur, or elsewhere. But the point is, again, that's why we're specialized. Some deal with the humanitarian aspects, political aspects. The rest of us are promoting growth and also wealth creation, which is needed for sustained uh, mm. uh, peace and democracy in a number of these countries. Well, Dr. Nkela, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Welcome thank you. to London. Thank you very okay. much.